this agreement between people with opposing opinions or principles. It's an active, it's active, it's not a passive. It's an active disagreement between people with opposing opinions or principles. There are few synony synonyms which are, you know, because it's a conflict, it's a very broad spectrum word. So there are a lot of synonyms which go along with it, like from strife, discord, friction, disagreement, dissension, warfare, war. So it's <coughs> starting from basic disagreement can even go up to war. So basic disagreement between two people, I like Italy, I like Dosa. Or I like, uh, you know, Karnataka, I like Tamil Nadu. Some simple disagreement can go up to war where there is loss of life. There is destruction and loss of life. So it's a huge broad spectrum. Now biblically there is nothing inherently wrong with conflict. Don't fight, you say, don't fight. You know, you have kids at home, don't fight, don't fight. The whole time they're telling, don't fight, don't fight. But biblically there is nothing wrong with conflict. It is a normal phenomenon. Why it's normal? Because no two people think the same. Everybody has a different thought process, they think, you know, opinion, the way they process information, the way they view on a particular thing. Like even if you take, uh, you know, twins born, you know, of the same zygote, they are twins, identical twins. Still when they are growing up, they don't behave the same. They react differently. They are totally having probably, you know, opposing views. One might like the BJP, one like the Congress, or one likes you know, different things. So they're completely different. So the, you cannot say two human beings are the same. That they think exactly the same for every situation in life. That's why conflict is part of life. We have to get used to it. We cannot be done away with conflict. Oh, I'm always going to live happily forever after. And there's going to be no conflict in my life. Most of the couples in the altar, when they stand, that's what they think. From today onwards, we are going to live happily ever after. How many couples in this room? There's a few couples. So others are going to be couples. <laughs> okay, so the conflicts happen everywhere. They happen at your, you know, right from the time they are born, in your school, in your colleges, and as you go to workplace, your profession, you know, in the nation, between the nations. There are wars, like right now they say we have, you know, the wars which are happening in the world are almost five wars are taking place <coughs> at the same time. So there is so much of conflict, there is there is so much of pain, there is so much of loss of life. And there are some, you know, if you think this, uh, what happened in the past, there was some conflict which just lasted 38 minutes, a war, which lasted 38 minutes only. But there is a war, which is the longest war in history, which lasted 781 years. Imagine almost eight generations of people lived through war. So war which actually began with a single seed, it was not nipped at the bud, it went on to reach the, you know, the final spectrum of a conflict resulting in loss and destruction. And where does everything start from? Entire thing starts from a single seed of discord or dissent which is sown. And for us where it started? It started with our first parents, Adam and Eve, the garden of Eden. So it was uh, Genesis 3. So before they ate the forbidden fruit, Adam, Eve and God were in perfect harmony with each other. They had no discord. They spoke to each other, they met with each other, there was love, there was peace, complete harmony, nothing missing, nothing broken at that time. And then what Eve did? She ate the forbidden fruit. And after eating the forbidden fruit, then the entire equation changed. The harmony became disharmony. Everything that was good, now there was a every, there was a every, what do you know, there was a what do you call it? A point of entry for sin to come in. And the sin came in and changed the equation. So Adam is not blaming who? He's blaming Eve. He's also blaming God. He said, You gave me this woman. So you are also at fault. And what is Eve doing? Eve is blaming the serpent. So now there is a complete disharmony.
harmony taking place right from our first parents. And what was the consequence of that disharmony? It led to the first death. Their son, their firstborn son Cain goes on to kill Abel, his younger brother. That was the, what you call, the seed or the result of the conflict which took place in the Garden of Eden. You understood? So like that, throughout the Old and the New Testament, you have a continuous flow of conflicts taking place by the seed which was sown by Adam and Eve. So you have like a conflict between Cain and Abel, Genesis 4, Abraham and Lot. Abraham and Lot were uncle and nephew. Then you have Jacob and Esau, two brothers. Then you have Jacob and Nobat, that is father-in-law and son-in-law. Then you have Saul and David. They were the first two kings of the, of the Bible. And, and Saul was constantly after David's life, chasing behind him. Like every time he is behind, like they, they are <coughs> running into the forest, he's hiding in the caves, and Saul doesn't let you know let go of David. He's constantly in pursuit of David. In the New Testament, you have two sisters who are in the spot. Who are they? Mary and Martha. Then you have Jesus. You think Jesus is the you know, he is the Lord of Lords. He has twelve disciples. And those twelve disciples are also constantly fighting with each other. Who will sit on the right? Who will sit on the left? Who is the first? Who is the last? You know, who will do this? Who will do that? So there is so much of conflict with each other. Then you have Paul and Barnabas. I will be coming to that later on because I am focusing on leadership. So I will be coming to Paul and Barnabas. So they also, you see in Acts chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas, they were, no, you know what, they were both of them preaching together the gospel. They were evangelists. They were almost like, uh, they say between 8 to 14 years, they were walking together from town to town, city to city, and living together, eating together, doing everything together. And then suddenly one, one person by the name of John Mark, he enters into the life. And there, in one particular part of the journey, this John Mark deserts them. He takes a walk. He is no longer with them. But after some years, he comes back. Now he becomes a bone of contention between Paul and Barnabas because Barnabas says, "I want John Mark to be with me in the in the continuing journey." And you know, Paul says, "No, he deserted us once. We are not going to give him the you know red carpet entry that he can just go out whenever he likes and come in whenever he likes." So he is not going with us. And because of this, two great evangelists, two great mighty men of God, mighty miracles they have performed. Paul and Barnabas now are at loggerhead with each other. They are in conflict with each other. And ultimately what happens? Paul goes one way and with him he takes Silas. He takes Paul and Silas. He takes Silas with him. And Barnabas goes the other way and he takes John Mark with him. So they split their part ways. They go different ways. They are evangelists, strong church leaders. So what I mean by all of this is that conflict is part and parcel of all our lives. Right from the smallest thing that we do to whatever, you know, you might be the greatest evangelist in the world, you will still have to face conflict in your life. Now the root cause for all conflict are just two. One is self-centeredness and the second is pride. One is self-centeredness, the other is pride. So if I am filled, if I, my heart is filled with love, is filled with joy, is filled with peace, then whatever is happening externally should not affect me. Because I am filled with love. You can do anything to tickle me, you can do anything to irritate me, you can do anything to take me off my track, but I should not go off track because I am full of love. I am full of love means what? I am full of Christ. Christ is like 100% inside of me. If Christ is inside of me 100%, then I don't have to worry about what the world you know, throws at me, what they tell, tell me, what they speak about me or anything. It should not tickle me at all. But the problem is, are we 100% Christ? Who is there inside of us? I know all of us, you know, anybody will ask, do you love Christ? How many hands you lift up? Wow. You lift your hands, you will probably lift your legs too, right? <coughs> yes. There is no doubt among any of you sitting over 
here whether you love God. Is there anybody has a doubt? Then we have to change the topic of teaching. Yeah? So anyone has a doubt that you love God and God loves you? Absolutely. You are 100%. But how much of Jesus is there in your heart? Is he 5%? Is he 20%? Is he 50%? Is he 70%? How much percentage is there of Jesus inside of you? Suppose he is 70%, that means the remaining 30% is who? <laughs> the world. The world. The world. <laughs> the world it, it, more than the world, it would be you. It's me who is inside myself. The remaining 30% is me. And suppose if Jesus is just 50%, the remaining 50% is me. And if Jesus is 20%, the remaining 80% is me. It is I, me, and myself inside of me. You understand me? I love God. I am speaking His word. I am walking the talk, whatever you can say. But the actual heart condition of an individual, only the individual will know. Whoever the person is, is how much portion have I asked my God to occupy inside of me? And because Jesus does not occupy the 100%, there is a portion of I, me, myself and me then the other person with whom I am coming in conflict with also has probably 30% of himself or 60% of himself or 90% of himself or probably even 100% of himself. So two I, me, myself will stand. What will happen? What will happen? There is going to be conflict. There is going to be conflict. Yes or no? Because who is standing? It's me. My self-centeredness is there. I have not allowed Jesus to be completely within me. Now this is a litmus test. We all say we love God, but actually we need to go back and sit and think, how much portion of our heart does God actually occupy? You're, you know, you know Colin was telling that you go back and say, the business happened. That's a question you literally have to sit and think for yourself individually. Lord, how much portion of my heart, do you actually occupy? Do I come to you with everything or do I come to you after I have decided, made all my plans and then come and tell you that bless my plans? Or do I come to you first and ask you what do you want me to do? Like Romans 12, 1 says, like moment you wake up the day, surrender the day, even before your leg touches the floor, you start the day, you surrender the entire day to God and say, Lord, let your plans be accomplished in my life. And only when we reach that point can we say that I am no longer self-centered. If I am not self-centered, then whatever the world may throw at me is not going to affect me or is not going to damage me. So you understand? So the main root cause for conflict is? Is what? I mean myself. Thank you, brother. That is self-centeredness. Because James 4.1, you know what does James 4.1 clearly says? Yes, yes, brother. Where do wars begin? Where do wars begin? Perfectly right. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from cravings that are in war within you? So I'll repeat it again, slowly and clearly. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from cravings that are in war? within you. Now the second one is pride. You now the Proverbs you can see there are so many scriptures with pride. Like Proverbs 13 10 says pride leads to arguments. Then Proverbs 11 2 says when pride comes then comes disgrace. Proverbs 16 18 says pride goes before destruction a haughty spirit before a fall. Even Jesus says in Mark 7 21 to 23 that pride is one of the many evils that come from within and defiles a person. So it is something which comes from inside and defiles a person. When you say pride, what comes to your mind first? God opposes the pride. God opposes the pride. Like if you think of a person, who will you think of? Think of Pharisees. The Pharisees. The Pharisees, yes. Then? Hitler. Hitler, okay. <laughs> okay, from the biblical point of view, yes. Lucifer, Lucifer. fantastic. So when you think of pride, he is the but the epitome of pride. He is the king of pride. It's Mr. Lucifer. So you Lucifer. Then you see uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. Full of pride. Because he won, he built a statue of himself. And he says that, you know, Daniel and his friends 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you need to come down and bow down and worship me. I am God. Then you have King Saul. You have King Saul who was so full of pride in self. So pride is a very what uh, demonic spirit. It's not just a simple spirit. It's a filthy demonic spirit. Walking in pride leads to destruction. So all conflicts, whatever the conflicts could be there, the two causes are self-centeredness and and yeah, can you tell loudly? They are self-centeredness and pride. Now within a church, now we are talking within a church, why is there a conflict? There are four, you know, what you could say, four kinds of conflicts within a church. The first is a doctrinal conflict. What is it called as? Doctrinal conflict. <coughs> There's a disagreement over how you interpret the scripture or the church's belief system. You have a doctrinal conflict. And this is basically a disagreement over how you interpret a particular scripture or a church's belief system. The second is a personal conflict within the church. This happens between uh, you know individuals within the church because of misunderstanding, there is personality clashes, or there is hurt feelings, right? Different personalities. People are hurt because the pastor said something, or the leader said something, or some other member said something, and they are hurt about because of that, and there is you know misunderstanding between the people. Then there could be a resource conflict. There could be a Resource conflict means of how do you use the resources that are from the church, that is basically finances or facilities. Every church is blessed with finances and there are facilities that the church gives. So how people use that, that could lead to conflict. And the, the topic that we are talking about is leadership conflict. The fourth type of conflict is leadership conflict. is because disagreement among leaders themselves or between leaders and members. You understand? It's pretty simple. There's a disagreement between like, two different uh, prayer groups. The leaders disagree over, you know, they have some kind of disagreement between leaders or there is a disagreement among the group itself between the leader and the members. So there could be disagreement. And this also could be because of different leadership styles. Some are unbeliever Christians. Some are just they want to, you know, silent Christians. Some are uh, always praying in tongues, some don't believe in praying in tongues. You understand it? So, so they could be disagreements because of that. Understanding? So it's simple. So they are not liking, they don't like the other leadership style. Someone doesn't like this particular leadership style, so there is a clash. There is a conflict. They could be also like difference in the vision that a particular leader has for his ministry and for the church. It may completely clash with some another ministry. So that's why all these conflicts happen. Now when a conflict happens, how do people behave? How do people, they normally say people behave like either of the two animals. There are two animals. One is called as a skunk and one is called as a tortoise. You know what's a skunk? Yeah, a skunk is an animal in the face of, you know, a conflict or like he's scared or if there is going to be a predator is coming, it instantly emits an offensive smell. It's a terrible smell he gives out so that everybody, you know, just runs away from him. The skunk's response to a conflict is by emitting a terrible offensive smell. What does the tortoise do? Sorry? It's slow. 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 It's and tortoise, what does it begin? It goes inside the shell and it hides away from the conflict. So people are also like that. Some people, when there is a conflict, they'll open the mouth and the worst of the abuses and anger and hatred and all the colorful languages will be coming out. 
they create such an offensive atmosphere around them. Understand? Maybe the offense is just just a little bit. But they will be yelling and screaming and shouting and making such a racket. And the words they speak are totally unparliamentary. But forget parliamentary, you cannot speak anywhere. Both languages will be coming out. They are so offensive. But there are other people who moment the conflict is going to start, they are gone inside. They gone into a shell. They hidden themselves. I can't see evil, no evil around me. I don't want to see evil. Evil does not exist. I am not going to, you know, handle this conflict at all. So one is overreacting, the other is not reacting. You understand the difference? The offensive person is overreacting and the Tota is like a person is not reacting. Now both are wrong. We have to react the correct way, the way Jesus taught, taught us how to react. We have to react. We cannot overreact or not react. If we don't react, what will happen is like when there is a conflict and you don't want to address it. Most of the people, you know, the offensive people are also very, you know, very loud and clear and they, they vent their anger, hatred, everything comes up. But the other one who has a Tota is like character, they basically what they do, they are putting everything under the carpet. They are shoving all their what a frustration, their anger, then I'm not going to get angry at the person. It's un, you know it's not wrong that the Bible teaches me to be you know humble and submit and all those things. So I'm not going to deal with it. So I'll put it all under the carpet. So under the carpet, probably in a day they're putting a couple of ants. Ant like conflict. Little little conflicts, little discord, little dissent, but we don't discuss about it. For me, I want peace in my house. So I'd rather not address it. And and not going to confront my husband. I'm not going to confront my kids. I'm not confront my mother-in-law. I'm not going to confront my sister-in-law, father-in-law, or anyone. I'm going to be the you know the you know the holy person with the with the yeah. with the crown and everything around my head. So what do I do? I'm going to. I'm just taking an example of me. Don't go and tell this to my <laughs> husband or my family. I'm just telling that so that it is easy for you to understand. So it's just like that. So what I do? I am putting everything under the carpet. So every day I am putting in a couple of ants. I am giving an example as an animal, as an ant you can understand. So a couple of ants are going in. Every day I am shoving in little, little, little. I am not, you know, I am not going to use any bad words. I am just a tortoise. I just go into my shell and I believe the conflict is just going to disappear by itself and Lord will take it away. I am putting it all under the carpet. And one day suddenly the ants have all joined together. Now a massive elephant is standing in front of me. And I say, oh my God, this is too much. Maybe the husband would have said only one small something, you know, that, that little thing that broke the camel's back. And I'm saying, I had it. I'm not dealing with this. I want out. I want a divorce. That's it. Why did it happen? Because I did not deal with the ants. I did not deal with any of the ants. I just pushed them under the carpet and they accumulated and accumulated and accumulated. Now those ants have all joined together. Now it's no longer a single ant. It's a massive giant elephant. It's a massive conflict. And they said, I can't deal with this. I couldn't deal with an ant. So how do you expect me to deal with an elephant? So now what is the easy way out? I'm taking my way out. Why, Tata, I can't deal with you. We are going to the court. We are fighting for divorce. And we are you know, just parting our ways. I can't. So whose mistake was that? Because you did not deal with conflict. And that is a problem with every church, every ministry, every human being that we do not deal with conflict. To get a little peace for now, we are, you know, trying to push away a problem and tomorrow the problem is becoming so massive. And that's why so many, you know, amazing men and women of God are leaving the church. Because no one has spoken to them, no one has dealt with them, no one has sat down and told, okay, you're going to face conflict. Conflict is going to happen, everybody should be ready. The moment you get married and you say, yeah, you know, in good times and bad times and sickness and health, I will be with you till the end of the time and you walk down the church, you're already, you not no, she said this to me. Your dad, no, he came late to the church. You already, conflict has started. So you should be prepared for that. And if you are prepared for that, then you will deal it in the right way. So the main teaching now is how 
do you deal how Jesus taught you to deal? It was not my way or your way. We have to do the Jesus way. Understand? So we have to do the way how Jesus dealt with conflict. So for that we go to Matthew chapter 18 verse 15 to 17. Matthew 18. I'll read the scripture then I'll explain to you. Matthew 18, chapter 15, uh, Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 17. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Okay, so very simply put it is like, if you, if you, you know, someone in the church is sins against you, what do you do? You go meet up with the person, you talk to the person, and you try to sort it out. <coughs> if the person doesn't listen to you, then you go back, bring two or more members, go to the person, try and sort and talk it out. Still, the person doesn't listen, then you go and you know tell it to the church. Church is a body or members who are present in a church or a committee or community of people or who are worship together. So tell it to them, and even then he doesn't listen to you. Then, for you, he is as good as a tax collector or a Gentile. Now, who are tax collectors or Gentiles? They are the people who are totally abhorrent to the Israelites. They are the, like, you know, someone who is an outcast or something. We have nothing to do with Gentiles. We have nothing to do with tax collectors. So, at this point, you tell, I have nothing to do with this particular brother or sister of mine. This is what, uh, you know, how you deal with some, uh, some other person's sin. Now I'll break that down and make it into simple steps. So which was the scripture I gave you? Matthew 18, 15 to 17. Okay, the so first step is take the initiative. What is the first step is? Take the initiative. When you want to have a conflict, you will be the first one to take the sorry. <laughs> when you want to dissolve a conflict, I'm not starting a conflict. When I have to resolve or dissolve a conflict, the, the first step is take the initiator. So what is the first word that, you know, the verse 16 says, 15 says is, if another member of the church sins against you, go. He says, go. Didn't say wait for that person to come back and tell sorry to you, then you tell. Now normally husband and wife fight, like me and Suresh fight, suppose. That's how we are. If we fight, and I say like Suresh is responsible for 99.999% of the conflict. My part of the conflict is only 0 0.00001. The women are like that, right? Always shift the blame to, to the men. Blame the serpent. <laughs> no serpent, they're just blaming each other. So blaming uh, the husband and so I will be sitting at my part of the conflict is only 0 0.00001. It's minuscule. So why should I go, you know? Let him, he's done 99.99% of the whole conflict. He's given me such a headache, what tension, what, you know, agony in my heart and I want to go back to my mother's house and my father's house and because of this guy I have to listen to him, I have to listen to the church, I have to submit to him, I have so much of anger inside of me. So let him come down and tell him sorry to me. And once he said sorry, I come. Times, probably I will listen to him. Oh, it's okay. No, it's okay. Don't let me now patch up with you. Still, I will put up my prize up because you are responsible for most of it. So it's not my fault. That's a normal human, you know, response. Now I am just saying 99. Suppose it is even 60 or 40 or it is 50, 50, whatever it is. The main uh, approach is let the other person come and say sorry. When he comes and says sorry, then I will say, it's okay, it's okay, fine. Now you said sorry, now we can think about patching up. But is that what Jesus taught us? When he was dying on the cross, stretched out, completely stretched out, every tendon, every ligament, every bone, every tissue.
tissue, every muscle had been pulled out the previous night as he walked that via Bonarasa to the cross and every blood from his body was drained out. He hung on that cross for excruciating hours over there. He looked down at this tormentors and they are looking at them and he could have had so much of anger but what does he say? He had zero percent. He was sinless. He didn't commit a single crime. The entire crime of humanity was placed on his shoulders and he is hanging on the cross and he looks down and looks at his father and says forgive these murderers. He didn't tell them Lord if they ask for forgiveness then you forgive them Lord. Like none in his heart he could have had. Still he wouldn't be wrong. But he could look at all the fallen dirty humanity, people who have put the spear on his chest, people who pulled his beard apart, who spat at him, who mocked him, who gave him so much torture for him, giving so much of love to them. But he could look at this terrible human people and still look at God and say, God forgive his people. He took the initiative. He didn't say, you come and ask me for forgiveness. He says, I forgive you even before you even realize that you need forgiveness. You know, he went to that point. People didn't even know that they need forgiveness. If they had not even, you know, asked for forgiveness at that point, if he had not offered, none of them would have been saved and that would come down to the whole humanity. None, nobody would have been saved. But Jesus gave forgiveness to the mankind even without anyone asking for it. So he teaches us. Even if you have committed 0.001% of the conflict is you are the cause, you go take the initiative, go ask for forgiveness. Go ask for forgiveness. Go and make up. Why what the Bible says about be a peacemaker? What does Matthew say in the Beatitudes? Matthew 5, the seventh Beatitude is, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. So do you want to be called children of God? Yes or no? Yes. See, if you want to be called the child of God, you have to be the one who takes the initiative. You have to be the first person who takes the initiative. Go. 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 He says, go. So always remember the first word is take the initiative. The word is go. What do you have to do? Go. Yes. So when you say take the initiative and if, if you are not at fault, take the initiative and go. Do you say sorry even though you are not at fault? No, no. Or we come through the discussion of how moment you go, I'll, I'll, I'll start telling you. Okay. Yeah. Claudica is pretty enthusiastic like I should. First okay, I'll see who are you fighting with the first conflict with me. Moment I see Lina, okay, shh, I'm sorry, you know, the whole thing. It's such a, actually such a beautiful thing because what happens is like a, uh, it's like suppose a uh, big balloon say. Anger is just being pumped into it. It's Going, becoming big and becoming massive and massive and massive and the moment you say sorry, what happens? The entire thing will be placed like this. The thing which was going to burst and maybe create a racket, the entire thing becomes a diffused, like it's like a bomb disposal squad will become. Basically everything goes, the entire bomb has been diffused. There's no spark in it, there's no more fire going to take place. Nothing is going to happen. That's how it is. But then uh, I will come to a point. Is the first is you take the initiative. So first the word is you go. You need to go. Go and take. So if somebody <coughs> is having an issue, just uh, with, you have an issue with someone, don't just leave it like that. Go take the initiative. The second is you call for a conference. You call for a conference. So first what did I say? You need to go. You need to go. And the second is you call for a conference. So what conference you're going to call for? You're going to call for a press conference. Oh. Yeah. You're going to call a press conference. I'm going to call all my brothers and sisters in my ministry. I'm going to call all my loved ones in the ministry and I'm going to tell them, do you know what he did to me? Do you know what he did to me? Do you know what she did to me? Do you know what she's done? What he has done? We call press conferences. Yes or no? When I get angry, Suresh, I call my mom. What is that? It's a press conference. 
And I'll call my sister. I have one sister, an older sister. So I'll call her. It's a press conference. Conference call. Yeah, it's a conference call. <laughs> and on more people than the call. Do you know what Suresh did? Yeah? I got to Suresh, that's why you have this teaching. I have it. Just for an example. Just for an example. Okay, so what we do is we call a press conference, but God is not saying call for a press conference. He says call for a peace conference. You're calling for a peace conference. And who are members in this peace conference? Who are going to be there in that? Nobody. No. You read the first line, I'll read again for you. Go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. When the two of you are alone. So it is you and the person you have the conflict with, with Jesus Christ. Because wherever you two you are there, you have to have the Lord with you. So go. First is you need to go, take the initiative. And the second is what you will do? Call the press conference, right? Mm -hmm. If anybody says press conference, I will say rise up on the bench. Stand on the bench. What do you call for? Peace, peace conference. Call for a peace conference. And the peace conference will be attended only by you, the person you have the conflict with, along with Christ. You understood? This is the second, second part of it. The third is now you need to address the conflict with love. The third point is you need to address the conflict with love. This is the most uh, challenging part of the, of the entire process, is addressing the conflict. Nobody wants to look down a brother and say, you did this to me, you did this to me, you have done that, you have done that, I don't like you, you did this, you are bad, you spoil my name, you, you know, all those actually the, the messy part of the conflict comes here. You deal with this part, there are many parts that are very easy to follow through. But this is the messy part for people. Why? Because they are self-centered. There is pride. Pride, you know, like, you know, what is he, you know? I have, in, if I am going to say that, you know, I am sorry for what I have done, or he is exposed, and I am exposing my vulnerability to this person, and this person is going to misuse, probably he is going to go outside and he's going to make a mockery of me, he's going to tell other brothers and sisters in Christ about, oh, you know about that sister, oh, you know about that brother, and this and that, you know. So it's a difficult part of the, difficult part of the entire process of resolving a conflict is when you need to address the issue. But you need to address the issue because that's what Jesus did. Jesus also was in conflict. And with, with whom he had conflict with? Judas. Judas was the person Jesus actually ran, you know, behind him the most. He went behind him the maximum because he knew that he is going to betray him. And now it comes to a point after three years, three, three and a half years of living together, walking together, sleeping together, eating together, Judas is holding the purse of the, the purse, the treasurer of the of the, of the of the group of people that Jesus worked with. He handled every finances, he handled everything that was to be paid. He was the main guy holding the treasury and now it comes to the Last Supper. They're sitting in the Last Supper, Judas is sitting uh, you know, next to Jesus and Jesus knows that Judas is going to betray him. There's a conflict already arise because he's already gone and met with the Met with whom? The chief priests and the, and the scribes and all to betray Jesus. So he says, the person who is dipping his hand in the bowl along with me is the one who is going to betray me. So that is, he is telling Judas, I know Judas that you are going to betray me. I know that you are going to betray me. But I am giving you this option, change. Repent, come back to me. Reconcile with me. Make your relationship back with me, back to what it was before. I know what you are going to do. I know you are going to betray me, but come back to me. Come back to me. Restore your relationship with me. He is giving the olive branch to Judas. Because everybody is asking, is it me, is it me, is it me, is it me? All the disciples are asking, is it me, is it me, is it me? And he is telling it is the one who is putting his finger in the bowl. But does Judas, uh, Judas take that olive branch? He doesn't. He doesn't take and because of that, he's lost. Now, Jesus and Peter. Peter was a man who was, you know, the rock on which I built the church. So Jesus was saying, and this man says, let everybody go, but I will not leave you. I will come behind you. And Jesus 
So since what? Kilo the concrete is already coming. Even before the concrete was twice, you would have betrayed me three times. You would have told me. And exactly the same happens. But to Peter also, Jesus gives all the branches. He says, come back to me. And Peter comes back. He repents. He comes back. He restores his relationship. And because of that, he becomes the first. He becomes the first pope of the church. So you realize Jesus could have, what he could have said, let Judas be down. Anyway, he is going to betray me. My mother is sitting and eating with me. To help with him, I don't want to do anything with him. He could have, but did he do that? He said, no, he didn't want his brother to be lost. You know, we have people, you know, we have other ministries, we have leaders who go the wrong way, who have fallen down big time. And what is our response? Take them and throw them away. Be done with them. We don't want those people in the church. We don't want to deal with them. Just take them and throw them out. But that's not what God is teaching us to. He says, no, you need to deal with them. You have to deal with them. You have to deal with them. Why? Because they are precious to God. You know, because the Bible says here, if he listens and comes back to you, you have regained the one. Regained means what? You lost him, but now you have gained him back. And since you have gained him back, he is going to be a bigger blessing to the church. He is going to evangelize. He is going to preach. He is going to do the uh, the work that God has called him to do. So it's a great, it's a great uh, what do you call a uh, responsibility that we deal with conflict. That we don't let even people who have gone wrong, really wrong, whichever wrong sins are, whatever sins you can say, in whichever degree of sins they are, we have to deal with them. Now it's up to them. They refuse, like I told, they refuse the first time, second time, third time the fourth time and the fourth time then you can go. But it is our duty to take the initiative and bring them back to the church. So the first was what? Go and take the initiative. Second is what? Yes. Peace, Peace conference. Peace conference. Third is what? And there is a problem with love. Now when you sit down with someone, we all quote scriptures. Suppose I take a banner and stand, repent and be baptized or you will go to hell. I must be the truth or false. I am speaking the truth. But is it a nice truth for you all to listen? Suppose you are all Christians. I am standing and holding the banner and opposite the Holy Ghost Church where everybody is walking. I am standing over there and holding. People, are they going to love Christ? They say, no, I don't want to do anything to this lady or whatever she's put over there. If you let the spirit, then it doesn't matter. Does it matter to you? But is it, how is the response of the people? Does it So, suppose I hold a banner and say, Jesus loves you so very much. That he died on the cross for you. Do you want to know this Jesus? Will people stand back and take a look? Yes. Yes, both are the truth. I have the first first banner is also the truth. The second banner is also the truth. But the second banner, I'm talking with love. I'm talking with love. So when you when you are giving the truth with love, there is more chance that it will be accepted. But when you speak something, the truth. The saints is the truth only, but you speak it without love, then there is more probability that it will be resisted. You will not find a change or transformation in the other person's heart. So when you are sitting down to have a dialogue with someone who's gone the wrong way, do speak the truth, but speak it with love. Like it's a, suppose a conflict between husband and wife. Husband and wife are sitting, and there is a it's a quarrel. So the husband says, "You know what the Bible says? The Bible says." You as a wife have to submit to me. Since you have not submitted to me, so all these things are going to come against you. He's speaking the truth. So wife is, what is she going to have her, what will be the normal thought in her mind? I don't want anything to do with this place. Already I am so far away, let me move a little more far away. But suppose the husband says another way. The hus husband says, the Bible teaches us, that I need to submit to you, you need to submit to me, we both need to submit to each other according to the word of God because I love you so very much. God in me helps me to love you so very much. So what is the outcome of that? The reconciliation. You are understanding the difference, both are the truth. But you need to speak the truth with love. When you speak the truth with love, the brother or the sister who are going the wrong path, there is no chance that they will come back to the law. They will come back to doing what God has called them to do. So you need to address the issue 
like how Jesus addressed it, and you to address it with love. Now, the, just two more points before I finish. The other is listen. You need to listen to that person. Now you have addressed the issue. Now you also have to listen to the, the person. You have to listen to him. That's why God has given us two ears and one mouth. But we usually be, uh, behave like as if we have one ear and two mouth. And sometimes we behave like we have three mouth. Why? Because we don't listen. We don't listen at all. It's only talking and talking and talking and talking. You did this, you did this, you did this, you did this, you did this. So much of talking and talking, we don't have time to listen to others. That's why God says, listen. Just, just common sense. You have got two ears. And you just got single mouth. So listen with both your ears attentively. Because sometimes during a fight, people are speaking loudly, speaking words. And we are hearing the words, but we are not hearing the emotion behind them. We just hear the words, the words hurt us, but we're not looking at the emotion that is coming behind the words. Listen to it. Listen, why is she speaking like this? Why is he speaking like that? Listen to listen to their point of view. Listen to what they think about the situation. You know, probably walk in their shoe for some time. You never know what 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 uh, situation they are coming from, what challenges they are coming from, what difficulties they have faced, what has led them to this particular point where this fault has happened. So don't judge. Don't jump to judge them. Give them a space where they can open up and speak and tell about what, why was this fault committed? Why did these things go wrong so dramatically? Why things went? So you need to listen. Be empathetic. Be empathetic. Listen to them. And listen to the situation. Listen impartially. Do not judge. And the last one is only if you put on Christ can you actually solve the problem because 1 John 4, 16 to 18 says, those who say I love God but hate their brothers and sisters are a great people. Read the Bible. Yes. Those who say, you all said you love God, right? You all? Yes, anyone who said he does not love God? Is that? 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 Do you understand? So when we are going to pinpoint somebody and say, you have called it, you are this, you are wrong, you are this, you are that, you are that. What is the Bible telling us? And what are we? We are liars. And who is the father of lies? So you know who some of we belong to? Are we children of God? Are we children of Satan? It's very really clear. It's very clear. It's so easy. We fall into this trap so many times. Yes, sister. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. So, so we fall into this trap. So it is uh, the God Himself says in that one John four sixteen eighteen is that those who say I love God and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they cannot see. How can they? Sorry, sorry. Five minutes. Yes. One John four sixteen to eighteen. I'll, okay. I know people are saying it's over time. This last scripture. This I'll I'll read it out to you. Those who say I love God and hate their brothers and sisters are great men and women of God. Are are I want you to tell loudly. Liars. 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 For those who do not love a brother and sister whom they can see cannot love God whom they cannot see. Write it down. When you get angry, you know, from the scripture, I, I'm not a child of God or I'm a child of Lucifer. You have to decide. You can be either a child of God or you can be either a child of Lucifer. There is no, uh, no mid to no other path. Either you are here or either you are there. Now, you should be either here or there. You should follow either God or you can follow Lucifer. So, you cannot hate your brother or your sister. Yes, sister. You cannot hate your brother or sister in the church. If they have committed a crime, if they have committed a sin against you, the four steps are there. Is first, you speak to them alone in love. If they don't listen to you, then take two or three. Why take two or three? 
So that the other two or three are elders in the church, or they are people with you know believe more spiritual maturity, and they will be able to pacify. They will be able to give their inputs, their knowledge. Still he refuses or she refuses, then bring it in front of the whole church. So when you bring it in front of the whole church, now the whole church knows about the situation. Now they will come together to you know talk to this particular person. Now still this particular person refuses to change, then you have to keep him away. But what do we do? We take the last step. The moment we know there is something wrong, spiritualo, throw him away, out of the church. Keep him away. Nothing to do with this particular person. You understand me? So God has given particular steps that we need to take if we have to resolve a conflict. Was this easy? Yes. Was this challenging? Not challenging, it should be. I hope it is challenging. If it is not challenging, then you have never had a conflict in your life. It has to be challenging. Because it's easy to say, but difficult to put into practice. Amen? Yes. But my question is still not answered. Yeah, I shouldn't come to that point because you have time. Three minutes. Three minutes, okay. So now the, I, the first four points, what did I say was? Listen, put on Christ yeah. and the last is use the magic words. Use the magic word. What is the magic word? Sorry. What is the magic word? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Please. 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 So what I will say here is, Suppose there is a conflict and you are only 0.01% believe. The other person is 99.99%. So you would meet the person and you say, I'm sorry, you have done nothing wrong. But you say, I'm sorry. And then you say, you know, kindly or please forgive me because I was only thinking about me. I did not think about you. So what will happen? The person is going to change. Okay, no, he'll paint off. <laughs> He will faint off. He will be so shocked. I have done 99.9 percent of the problem, and this one is coming and asking for forgiveness. And she's adding two more words. She's saying that forgive me because I was only thinking about myself. See, when he was angry with me, I was only thinking about myself. So what is he going to do? So when he wakes up, probably give some water or sprinkle some water, give some glucose. When he wakes up again, he repeat the same words. What he will say? I'm so sorry, honey, I'm so sorry, so and so, I'm so sorry, darling, or whatever. It's a man, a woman of Christ, brother in Christ, sister in Christ. Please forgive me. Do a little more. Please forgive me. And then you say, I'm so sorry, I was only thinking about myself. I never thought about you. Again, the person is going to think. <laughs> then again, you resisticate the person and you bring him back. And then again, you repeat the same words. Why? I'm just dramatizing it. No, no, I'm just dramatizing it. So that it will go into your head. No one is going to find out anything. I'm just saying the the magic word sorry is so magical that nobody uses it. I just saw an Instagram meme where the husband is telling the wife all big big words, you know. Say efficacious. She says efficacious. She says ever present. She says ever present. Say sorry. So 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 she's stuck. Then he says, you see magnanimous. I'm just using some words. Magnanimous. She says magnanimous. She says, you know, can you hear the big word brother? Expectation. Expectation. She says expectation. She says sorry. So, 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 so. Sorry, fine letter word doesn't come out from her mouth. You know, we think it's just a meme, but it's actually true. It's so difficult to put to death ourselves. When I put myself to death and I am not operating in pride and I put on Jesus Christ, I will get the courage to walk in love. And when I walk in love, the conflict is. Diffused. Now I'll tell you, when this conflict happens, try and sort it out with a magical number 7, with a biblical number, try and sort it out at least 7 times. But then, this is not for the church. Church, I told you the technique. Church, I told you the technique, right? But if it is between people conflict, if you are having a fight with your spouse, with the children, with the parents or anybody, you try and sort it out 7 times. If it doesn't happen, then you need help from other sources, you need counseling or you know, people from the elders to come and help you out. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. All excited? Yes. You go to sleep or go to eat? <laughs> Can you raise your right hand up? Okay, I want to see all your awake or still go to sleep. Left, 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 both your hands. Right, 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 
right, right, left. Okay, both hands. Oh, God bless you. Thank you so much for listening to me.